as well as our website. Come on and join us on the Crooked River. Welcome aboard. We're headed for the world according to Elmer. With hosts Jerry Sorensen and Pat Morrow. Don't worry, you'll enjoy it there. Better buckle in and enjoy the ride. Here come our hosts now. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the world according to Elmer. I'm your host, Jerry Sorensen, KG8RRY. And with us tonight, somewhere on the other side of that blue screen, is Mr. Pat Morrow. He is N8OQP. And the, the thing that the both of us have in common, we're just, we just finished up with field day and we're excited about field day. Pat, how are you, my friend? I'm doing too bad as soon as I can find you. <laughs> <laughs> I got when you showed up, I disappeared. <laughs> yeah, we're working on it. It's all good. Hey, while you're getting that ready, I've got to tell you, I was just looking over re a receipt that uh, a friend sent me. Uh, there's a ham radio operator. You know him, by the way. Uh, his name is John uh, John C. in Wadsworth, Ohio. And uh, I won't say his, his uh, full last name, but he uh, happened upon a receipt that he found in his drawer uh, today. And this was his first HF uh, radio that, that he had purchased. And this was back on January 30th of 1970. Now, he bought an ICO 753 uh, with a matching power supply and a Shure 444 microphone to go with it. You have to have something to talk with, right? I guess all of his rigs uh, prior to this rig had been uh, strictly CW only. And so this was his first sideband uh, transceiver. What do you suppose he paid for this jewel? Do you know? Probably back when was, give me a date. Again, the date was January 30th of 1970. Richard Nixon would have been in office, right? Probably, <laughs> I'd, I'd say it's a stretch for about 500 bucks. Probably a little oh, less. Oh, yeah, oh, that's way high. The, the ICO 753 with the power supply and the Shure microphone total came to $210 for the wow. entire set. Wow. <laughs> you know, I don't know that you can get a, can you get a two meter radio for your car for 200 bucks these days? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think so. Just straight two uh, well, meters. Barely if you just, can. Just straight two <laughs> meters. It this is. is just, uh, that's just amazing that uh, that kind of a change can take place from, of course, you know, I think of 1970 as like yesterday, and that was what, eight, nine, ten, that was, that was 60 years ago. So, I, you know, uh, just because it seems like yesterday, well, that doesn't make it. I tough. was in high school back was then. A long time ago. What's that? I was in high school back then. I grew up yeah. 70, I was, uh, what? Probably 15 years old. I was born in yeah, 54, so I would have been 16. I was in high school also. We're pretty much the same age. So, uh, yeah, I remember. And the music was really awful. Uh, uh, songs like uh, I Adore You by Frankie Valley, that was popular back in about the 1970 era. <laughs> Those are uh, horrible songs. War. But anyway, uh, all that aside. <laughs> Oh, I know another song that was popular at that time. There was the one about, I've got a brand new pair of roller skates. Oh, by Melanie. New... Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. That was popular. Of course, then, about then again, then, then uh, again, you had White some Rabbit. Jewels, like Seasons in the Sun, was popular right about then. You so, had, yeah, you had White Rabbit. The White Rabbit. You had uh, Nana yeah. Hey, Kiss and Goodbye. Yeah. Uh, it was all awful. Yeah, it was, Just terrible oh, music. It was... <laughs> <laughs> Some maybe. No, you don't. You don't play any of that on the Crooked River, do you? No, nah, not at all. Well, no, some. <laughs> <laughs> some songs don't need to be replayed. We're gonna I do. Hope, uh, uh, if, if, go ahead. We're gonna do a um, real something kind of weird this weekend. Anybody that does yeah. like the '60s, '70s, and 
for the 60s and 70s. What we're going to do is start Friday night, and uh, we're going to go all 60s from seven wow. from five o'clock Friday afternoon until se um, until 10 o'clock. Uh, I think it was uh, Saturday night. It'll be all 60s. At 10 o'clock, we're going to switch it to uh, all 70s and rock into uh, 10 o'clock Sunday night. And at 10 o'clock Sunday. Is, are, is actually, is there enough music from the night, 1970s to be able to fill 24 well, hours? <laughs> I've got uh, seven, 750 some songs. It'll be, I've, from I've the covered, 70s. I've covered weekends with this wow. before. So. Right. <clears throat> yeah, it's, uh, I carry, <laughs> each, each genre has got about so, six or 700 songs to it so far. So it'll be enough to cover it. And then uh, once we get into the, uh, probably after the crooked uh, or the uh, radioactive show, if I do one, it will be uh, we're, we're going to switch to 70s yeah. along with the um, music of America, which is all your Fourth of July stuff, and we'll run that through yeah. 10 p.m. 10 p.m. Monday. It's going to be a pretty cool lineup. I had this thought a couple of days ago, and I thought, you know, we ought to run that. So. Well, you know, this past weekend we did something a little unusual too. That's yeah. kind of interesting because it was kind of like a holiday going on around here. And now we've got a holiday coming up. So this is like two holiday weekends in a row. And so I have to ask you, El Presidente of the Cuyahoga uh, Falls Amateur Radio Club, uh, give, give me the, before we break it down, give me the overall impression of how things went in Summit County. We had a blast, first off. Wonderful. I had... Uh... We had people, a pretty pretty big stream of people both days. We okay. were visited by uh, 330 to go, the Facebook group, which is Hank, and I want to, I'll reach out to him after we use, uh, use the, the video. Um, we'll thank him for that. And uh, okay. then we were visited on Sunday at uh, noon by the mayor of Stowe, who was, uh, nice. who I was a friend of, uh, my my deceased wife used to work for him, okay. and uh, I didn't think he'd remember me. So when I reached out to him, um, I had just flat out asked him. I said, "You know, if I don't know if you remember me, but my wife used to work for you. Uh, what's the chances of you showing up at the at our field day site?" And he said, "Sure, I'll be out there." So wow, well he said, played. Well, well played. We come. Well, he says, "I'll come out uh, uh, Sunday afternoon about noon." And about 12.15, he pulls on his light, and he stayed for almost an hour. That is amazing. That's awesome. He's a good dude. Congratulations I've, to I've, the mayor of Stowe for doing the right thing. And uh, he was, uh, he pretty much walked the site. Him and his wife, his wife Cindy was there, and uh, actually Mayor Perbonic, John Perbonic. And uh, okay. we had, uh, I was pretty much two of the highlights. The other highlights that we had were just, to me, mind-boggling. I had one guy that was in 40 meters that made most of the 1,150 cues there. Uh, he himself was over 1,000 cues in less than a day. Wow, wow, wow. On 40-meter voice, Jerry. 40-meter voice. He, he, comes out, he comes out of that trailer Saturday or Sunday afternoon, and his eyes were this big. He says, I am so tired. I've been up since 8.30 Friday morning. He said, I got to get some rest. <laughs> so about 1.30, I sent him home. I said, you just go home, Jim. But, What's that country song about we can rest when we die or something like that? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but for the most part, uh, we had. Yeah, a, there's no rest for anybody during field day. You got to keep after it. We had our uh, our um, field day chairman, who you'll see in the 330 video. Um, okay. Really did a bang up job for us. He was a motivator, and he set goals. He he took and uh, we actually achieved some pretty steep goals as far as that was. He won. Okay. He told everybody, "I want over 2,000 cues to, for this thing." We got 2,600 or 2,500. Wow, so you, you went way over your goal. 2,552 was the actual contacts that we had. Well, you know what that means. Huh? That means that next year you've got to have a higher goal. Well, we'll do that. We'll see. Yeah. You know, the, the difference in the, the two years, though, I think, is, and this is uh, coming from kind of sort of personal experience, 
is that this year we are in a sunspot, a sunspot cycle and That's we are right. embedded in it. And last year and a year before that, and probably it had leveled out there for three or four years, though in, when in those points, we were not in a sun, sunspot cycle and the cues weren't anywhere near as near as good. The bands weren't as no, good. No, that's right. In fact, last year we would have been anticipating the upcoming exactly. sunspot cycle. Yeah. So exactly. yeah, it's a whole different, uh, it's a whole different dealio. And, you know, getting into that, uh, the fact was that you had bands that were open, especially at night that weren't normally open. We yeah. had, uh, there was one hour and seven minutes in 40 meters that uh, nobody made a cue for. And it wasn't because nobody was there. It was just wasn't happening. And we had a couple other bands that were similar to that. But on the other hand, some of the other stuff was open all night long. And uh, we had cues. Well, one uh, of the things that changed, oh, go ahead. We had cues on, on CW that, uh, that were pretty much constant. You know, there was always somebody there to talk to. Well, one of the things that changed from the prior year to this year that I can tell you from personal experience is, uh, well, actually, the, the uh, in 19 was my last field day prior to this. So I'm comparing 19 uh, to this year. In 19, I, you know, there's, there's two kinds of people on the bands. There are the people that just sit, you know, they, they park themselves on one band, and they're the ones that call CQ. And they get a pile up and they sit and they work that group of people until it runs out. Okay, you've got that group of people. Then you've got uh, uh, the hunt pounce people, and that includes me, where we start on one band and we work our way up the uh, from the bottom to the top of the band. And then maybe we'll go from 40 to 80 and then back to 40 again. We'll do that back and forth and we'll just run the bands. And uh, in 19, very often I would do an entire band. Let's say I did 40 meters bottom to top. If I went back and tried to run the band again, I would find the same people. And so basically at that point, you had a band full of duplicates and a duplicate yeah. doesn't mean anything for your score. That's so, exactly right. Uh, so you'd have to wait a while and kill some time and then you could do the band again. This year, when I would get to the top of the band, if I started over, it was all new people. So there were, there were way more people operating this year than there were in 19. I say that anecdotally because, again, I was able to reach people that just weren't there in 2019. And so that probably factored into your young man that did so well, uh, where he you know just did all those 40-meter contacts. He had fresh people all the time to contact this year, which is a big deal. Exactly. <clears throat> Him... Uh... As far as his contacts and that, he hardly left that trailer. There were, yeah. they, when we got to, uh, at, when he finally came out of there, there was a thousand, uh, there was a thousand nine on the sheet. And See, that's uh, the difference he, between a young guy and one of us old guys, because us old he's guys, he's not you know, that we young. Have, we have to take some breaks. Jim was not that young. He's, I think he's a couple years older than I am. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. But he's a contester, buddy. And that's, that's what it takes. Is. That's what it takes. <laughs> now, we should mention for the folks at home that field day is not a contest. <laughs> <laughs> Where it may appear that it is, it really isn't. You're, <laughs> you're actually, th the big things with field day is they're wanting to take and uh, they want to get the public's attention for one yes. thing. Because that, that's, that's that, number one, by the way, as far as I'm concerned. That's good for us. And yeah. secondly, they want to prove, they want everybody to prove that they're, they're emergency ready. And well, being... that's right. And that should be reassuring to the community. The reason we wanted everybody in Northeast Ohio to know that all of our clubs were out there, we want them to feel better about the fact that if the S hits the, or yeah, the, if the S hits the F, uh, there's going to be this group of people that can still communicate come what may. That's a big deal. You know, years ago, uh, Pat, I was talking to a guy that was the, uh, the head of a local uh, volunteer fire department, and he had a meeting, and he asked his guys, he said, what is it we do for this community? And, and one guy said, well, you know, we, we, if there's an emergency, we get in the squad, and we go out to whoever's house, and we pick them up, and we take them to the hospital. 
you know, people appreciate this. It makes them feel better. Or if there's a fire, we get in the fire truck and, you know, we go do our thing. And he was like, guys, now think about what you just said, because when was the last time that we went to a fire? And everybody had to admit it was like 10 years previous to that. They hadn't been out in 10 years on that fire truck. And, you know, and how often do we run that squad? A few times a week. Okay. He said, this isn't what we provide the community because look how little of what we claim to do we do. The service we provide to this community is we give them reassurance and they, they, feel, they feel better about living here because they know we're here and we'll be out in the event of an emergency. Well, the same thing with ham radio. It should reassure the community to know there's this group of people that is able to communicate when nobody else can get through. Yep, that's true. That's a big part of what we do. Emergency <laughs> communications on field day and making the public aware that we're there. Now, we had a number of visitors, Pat, that we were able to greet. We were able to sit some of them down at the radio and put them on. There are some people, they want to get on that radio. Now, there's other people that when you offer the radio, they're like, ah, you know, I can't really probably do this. And so they don't participate, but they like to watch. But it was a way of introducing people that might want to be amateur radio operators in the future to just what it is that we do. We actually had a, a uh, get on the air station also. And uh, we had, uh, in fact, I've got a couple of pictures uh, when we get to those of uh, the kids that we had there. We, we had uh, probably a dozen kids, a lot of families That's this awesome. year. We, we had five or six different families there this year. And I've got a picture of some kids uh, on, on the slides that I put together, too. So we're going to see some young people. Uh, yeah. if, if you're familiar with ham radio, great. And if not, don't buy into the lie that there are no kids involved in ham radio because mm. there are several in our club. Do we want to go there? Some in Pat's club. I think there's kids in every club. We want to go to the... the uh, um... Yeah, let's do that. Uh, you guys are listening to The World According to Elmer on the Crooked River Radio Network. And uh, I'm Jerry, that's Pat. Let's go ahead and, uh, and take it away here. Now I'm gonna put my glasses, goofy looking glasses on here, which uh, are, are, we've gotta figure something out about these glasses, Pat. Um, but at any rate, let's look at uh, our, this is our ham fest. And this was not in the city of Massillon, even though we are the Massillon Amateur Radio Club, but we had our ham fest in a park in Perry Township. And the park that we were in is adjacent to Perry High School in Stark County, Ohio. Here's uh, Jim and Fred, and as you can see, they are readying one of the two beam antennas that we had at Amfest this year. Now, we'll find out from Pat in just a few minutes how many stations that they ran in Cuyahoga Falls. We ran two stations as a club, which means that we were a 2A uh, group this year. Now, we did have a couple of other transmitters, and I'll show you both of them here in a second as we go through. So let's move ahead here, and uh, we'll see another picture of that same beam with our American flag that we have up top there. Every time that we go out, we have a W8P, which is the club call sign uh, flag, and we have uh, Old Glory, the American flag, and that's very important to our club. Uh, a lot of our folks uh, in the Maslin Club, Pat, uh, were World War II and Vietnam and and uh, and uh, I think one guy, Korea. Uh, uh, we got a couple guys that were in Desert Storm. Anyway, many uh, of the men in our club are were members of the service. And so the American flag uh, is a big deal uh, in our club. So at any rate, that is before the beam went up in the air. That beam goes up 40 feet, by the way. This young man uh, is, has been a club member for many years. Uh, he's Damien, and he was sitting at our GOTA station. So, Pat, what you're looking at in that picture there is our GOTA station, and we were able to actually make contacts on the GOTA station with uh, individual call signs. And additionally, as people came and visited, we were able to put many of those people on the air. And I'll tell you something else, Pat, we were able to use that station for. We have two members uh, of our club that have become disabled in the last year, and they're in wheelchairs now. And the, the van that we have that you saw earlier, that's not wheelchair accessible. There's no way for them to get up into the van. And so 
they were able to access the go to station and they were able to go ahead and be part of field day this year when they would have been uh, excluded had they not been accommodated. And so the lesson there, gang, uh, in your club, uh, wherever that may be, make sure that your facilities, uh, as we do these uh, events like field day, uh, can be uh, accessed by those who have special needs. End of sermon on that. Okay, down below the go to station here, I can see the top of Perry's head. That's his white hair. And uh, they're working on the coax uh, on the wiring for one of the beams. This guy below uh, what they're doing, this guy here, uh, what a, we had some uh, we had some shady, sketchy characters uh, at our at our field day this year, Pat. So if you want to move on down, here's one of them. Yeah, there he is. <laughs> this uh, that guy, the guy that now that is not a potato gun, Pat. Do you know what that is? I'm looking at it. I, <laughs> you're, you, no, I don't know what it is. <laughs> that is a beanbag gun. And <laughs> what that's, what's that, that's useful for is we have a beanbag about the size of a potato and uh, we attach that on one end of the rope. Yep. And that is the device that is used to launch that wire antenna over the top of 100 foot tall trees down there. That's a cool, cool idea. Yeah, isn't that an amazing piece of gear? One of the club members built that. That thing, uh, it can it can take up to 150 pounds of pressure uh, in order to top a uh, a 125 foot tree on the first uh, the first go. Uh, I used 60 pounds is all, and I cleared that tree by 20 yards. I have a couple of guys in our club that are really good with slingshots. And they, oh, the, that, and the one guy, when we got to do st something like that, he carries this uh, this sling with him. And I've never seen anybody launch some, launch a rock or anything like that like this dude can. It just yeah. goes. But It's so much easier. I mean, the, these some of these trees are so large, there's no way to climb them. So how are yeah. you going to get the wire over there? You got to be good with the slingshot or you got to have a device like this. That's what gets your wire up in the air. Uh, and as we know from Pat, we can talk anywhere in the world on 100 watts and a wire. That fellow right there is an interesting guy. That is uh, W8KXR. Uh, his name is Gene. And Gene is uh, a writer. And Gene takes pictures. And Gene is an outstanding ham radio operator. And uh, in fact, his, his thing is uh, AM. He, uh, brought, he likes to uh, broadcast or he likes to... Uh, make contacts in AM mode, not broadcast, uh, but he likes to make contacts. He likes to make QSOs in AM mode. And those are the big heavy transmitters that are used for AM. And uh, he is part of our six meter AM group. That's how I know Gene, but he's a great guy. And he has a whopper of radios, that guy there, let me tell you. Here's a couple of youngsters below. This is Damien that we saw earlier and he is with uh, Young Mr. Rankle there, and they are operating the Gota station. Now, this uh, next gentleman below, this is Perry, and uh, he's going to be doing some CW for us. Uh, it got a little bit nippy. Did it get nippy in the evening up there, Pat? I was told that it, by, by like midnight it was a little chilly. But it I, was. I Perry Peter. was operating in the evening. This was Saturday night, and he got, uh, he got a little bit chilled. And he came and asked me if uh, I had a jacket. I said, yeah, I've got one in the car, but it's, it's one of my school jackets from uh, the, the college I used to went to. I said, it's bright red. Do you mind wearing bright red? And he said, no. So there he put my jacket on, and there he is calling C, uh, CQ. And, and uh, Perry's an interesting guy. He can operate at about 45 or 50 words a minute. Oh, that looks good. Uh, yeah, yeah. I knew that you would have liked this particular slide. If you're going to do field day, you got to eat, right? That's right. <laughs> My food budget for field day about, at about 400 or 600 and, well, a little over $600 wow. now proves that you got to eat. <laughs> you got to eat. These guys aren't coming out for nothing. They're coming out to eat. We're guys. <sighs> got to eat. So, uh, yeah, there you go. Here's putting the American flag back up again. Now, this picture uh, this picture underneath, I got to show you. 
I thought this was pretty unique, and this happened this year. Those three men right there, that is Dave to the left and uh, Evan in the middle and Don to the right, Rankel. And uh, they are grandfather, father, and son. And oh, so we had, uh, we had three generations of ham radio operators represented at our field day this year. Sweet. How cool is that? Three generations of guys that are in ham radio at the same club, well, and they get along. <laughs> it's like we were discussing uh, at, at field day. You know, in order to get we, we get the kids involved and stuff, we were talking about ways of doing that. And I've I pointed out that, you know, it's normal for if a kid's exposed to the stuff when they're young, it's normal mm -hmm. for them to get the interest in it. And they're either going to get the bug or they're not. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. One of my well, one right. of my three kids did, and she's uh, she's a um, a general now, and but she, mm -hmm. she'd probably be an extra if she had the time to do it. But yes. uh, you know that, that's the way it, it works. You know, you have the stuff almost is is contagious, is, is the way I say it. I've said it before. So this kind of stuff here does not surprise me. He probably, yeah. the, the father probably picked that up from his father and it, and it just went down the chain. And that's exactly how it happened in that family. And I just think it's an awesome sight. Neither one of my, my sons, either one are interested in radio and that breaks my heart. But uh, in their family, there's a good tradition going on there. So don't tell, don't there, let anybody tell you there's no kids involved in, in ham radio. Now, are there as many kids today involved as in the past? No, probably not, because kids today have a lot more they can do, and they have a lot of distractions. Whereas back in, in the 1960s, 1970s, radio was pretty cutting edge. And, and today, what, you know, what, what does everybody carry? Everybody carries this kind of radio with them, and so this is what kids grow up with. Plus, there are video games today, and there's all sorts of other activities that didn't exist. But uh, just keep exposing your children to uh, ham radio. And with some of them, as Pat just said, in, in the case of his daughter, it will stick. So it's all good. This uh, next fellow down is WB0IQK. That is Mark. And Mark is operating with an 8-watt Zygu uh, 6100. And I was able to operate his transmitter for about a half hour. And even with all of the RF that was on the site, from the uh, two uh, stations that were on the air, uh, and and by the way, you would have laughed because I was on uh, I was on 15 meters, and yet whenever they would key the CW transmitter, the entire display, the entire waterfall on that little 6100 would just light up as if every frequency on the band was in use, and that was just the RF. But in spite of that, I was able to make uh, three QRP contacts on that little rig. Uh, one to Canada, and so it was a good distance. And uh, the other two from in the States here, but uh, but they were from far away states. And so we, it was amazing. If you've got a good antenna, it's incredible the contacts you can make even on nine watts, and even in prime conditions uh, like field day. So uh, now Mark, the, the fellow that's operating right now, uh, he's very, he's like Anthony. You know, he's very good at QRP, and he was able to do way better than I was. But I was able to eke out three, and I'm proud of those three. We need to move down. This, this next station, see the uh, transmitter on the left? That trans that is the DX-10, uh, and uh, that is a heat, heat kit. Uh, transmitter. Next to it is a Hallicrafters receiver that Mark is tuning as uh, this picture was taken. And that was our vintage station from the 1950s. And we used that for demonstrative purposes. And uh, all of the guests especially were very interested in the vintage gear. I was very gratified by that because that's a part of the hobby that I like. Okay, continuing on down. This is uh, Don, uh, N8IVJ. Don is our field day chairman, and so everything falls back on his shoulders at the end of the day. And he did an outstanding job this year, I just want to say on the radio uh, tonight. Don, fantastic. 
uh, you outdid yourself this year, buddy. Everything was well organized, and uh, and I know that uh, I appreciated all your efforts, as did uh, the other guys in the club. This next fellow down is another vintage operator. His name is uh, Rich. He is W B A U E W, and he is an he is an outstanding uh, ham radio engineer. Pat, he, there's just nothing he doesn't know. He's one of these guys that uh, you could give him a box of parts and he'll build your radio. That's your guy right there. I love okay, that. the next uh, slide down. This is a picture of those towers that I was showing you, you earlier. Except now they're extended, and you can see the kind of height and, uh, that, that we get. Now you can see there's a tower behind the tower in front, and it's much taller. But uh, the tower off of the uh, communications van is uh, is not uh, not a anything to laugh at either. Those Pat are both military surplus towers. Those came via the United States military, and we're sure happy to have them. They they're outstanding, and you just crank them up from right there on the ground and uh, you have to crank so far and then you put a new section in and you keep cranking them up and you put another section in. You do this all the way until they're extended like that and they do a good job. That's why we got as many contacts as we did because of that kind of antenna setup. That plus again, we were running wire antennas. This next, uh, this next series of pictures below our uh, fellow in the back there, ACHCL, Mark, ACHCL owns this van that is equipped with uh, with vintage gear, and it's a communications van. And wait till I show you the pictures of it here in a second. Here you can see him taking a six-meter uh, horizontal uh, antenna out. And, and so this was our six-meter antenna that we used out of his van. This next picture now I turned into black and white because I thought it suited it. Um, those are, Pat, World War II walkie-talkies. Yep, I've seen them. Can you imagine carrying those things around? That was your that was your little handy talk. With a uh, nine-foot antenna on them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you were a radio operator in the war, you were in danger of being shot at all the time because of that nine-foot antenna you're talking about. It was a target. So oh, down below the walkie-talkies, that's the inside of the van. What do you think? Wow. Isn't that amazing? All that military surplus gear. Those are the receivers, folks, you would have found in tanks or in uh, in in vehicles of different type. You'd have, you would have found those types <coughs> of transceivers in uh, airplanes. Anything the military was using had that kind of gear in it, and those are on every frequency known to man. This, uh, these, the frequencies represented in this trailer are incredible. There's nobody in the world you can't talk to uh, uh, they, with, with the stuff that is in this van. It is just amazing. And there's another picture right below it. This is more of that gear, that same gear that we're, we just saw. And uh, boy, there's just a bunch of stuff in there. It, it takes a while. To know what's in that van but that's quite a sight now here uh here, <laughs> here's don again he's our field day chairman and he has the heavy metal he's putting the hammer down buddy <laughs> we we had heavy metal at our ham fest and, and here this picture is proof of it right here and uh, so fortunately the only thing that got beat around at our ham fest was for the stakes going into the ground he didn't have to he didn't have to use that to encourage us to get more contacts. <laughs> and that's good. There's that W8NP flag I was telling you about. And as you can see, it's got the uh, radio communication Massillon OB Tiger on it. So, you know, we're a little crazy about our football mascot around here. So we had to put him on the club flag. So uh, there you go. Up in the air you go. Here's a couple kids. Guess what they're working on? They're working on uh, radio controlled airplanes and these airplanes have two uh, engines one on each wing and they are amazing you want to get kids involved in your club this is how you do it right here this is radio and yet it's radio in a fun way and, and so this kind of thing or or having your club meetings at the recreational center there's all kinds of ideas on how you can get kids involved but there should be kids at your field day and i'm looking forward to seeing the pictures that you've got 
this fella below, I, I, I'm sorry, I took this picture not because that was Fred. I just thought the hat was cool <laughs> with the tag on the side that said KB8SMO. <laughs> I thought that's a pretty good artistic picture right there. So I snapped that one of Fred. So Fred, 73, and thank you for the nice, uh, the nice picture. Nice hat there, buddy. Okay, moving on down. Oh, we talked about it earlier. You have to have grub. And this is the first thing that I saw on Saturday morning when I arrived. He was already there, and he was already loading that baby up with charcoal and uh, getting ready to go. And that food, uh, that food cooked all day. And boy, by Saturday night, it was amazing. What a treasure, uh, being out in the open air and having good food. And that, those are the end, uh, that's the end of my field day pictures. I want to tell you guys about something, uh, though, here at the end, since I had the slides running. Getting ready for the ham fest coming up in October, on October 30th at Maps Air Museum uh, there at the Canton Akron Airport. We're going to be having our 2022 ham fest again. So uh, make sure, guys, gals, that you put this on your uh, calendar. Uh We've got uh, we've got big times coming here at the end of the summer. You can go to whiskey 8 novemberpapa dot net and get all the uh, get all the 411 on uh, Hamfest uh, vendors and uh, folks going. You're going to be able here in the next few days to go ahead and buy your buy tables or buy your tickets right on the line. So uh, getting ready for the big day. Um, I've got a couple other pictures down. This is a this is a picture I snapped last year at Maps. What do you think? Look at that beauty! Isn't that's, that amazing? That's beautiful plane. And that plane is looking you right in the face. <laughs> yeah, mean. <laughs> this uh, and, and the one below that. Look at the size of this American flag. Isn't that incredible? And that sits down at the end of Maps uh, in the last year's Hamfest. That flag, and that was what everybody saw when they first came in. And how about that plane? Now, I know that if a plane has two wings, it's called a biplane. What is it called if it has three wings? It's a tri. A it's triplane? A, it's a triplane, yeah. Okay. I, I didn't know if it had a name or not, but I just think that's very cool. You know, back in the 20s and the 30s, they had men that would walk on those wings at shows. Yep. And women, yeah. too. Yeah. I, it would not be for me, Pat. <laughs> And I think that's about it. I don't know whether I got any more on here or not, but I think that pretty much wraps it up. Don't forget the Ham Fest, guys. 30th of October. Take plans to be there. Last year, we had a guy fly in in his private plane to be at the Ham Fest. So there you go. You I mean, are listening to The World According to Elmer on Crooked River Radio. And uh, that is Pat Morrow. He is N8OQP. I am Jerry, KG8RRY, and we are your host this evening, and we're glad you're here. So, Pat, I'm going to turn it over to you. My understanding is, from here, from talking to you earlier, you have a great video that was done at your ham fest this year. Let me uh, buzz through these uh, this PDF quick first, and we'll get, oh, in, okay. get into the video thing. That'll be... Uh, this will only take me a couple minutes here. I just wanted to show you a couple well, That's pictures. fine. You go ahead and take it away. This is my, uh, this is our field day chairman, Anthony Luskery. And uh, he is the guy that I, we had on here a few months back that uh, actually was a QRP. King. He was a QRP king. He's over yep. 90,000 QSOs in his 40 years. And um, Q, yeah, QRP. QRP, QSOs, right. <laughs> And that is crazy. I still can't believe that, but it is. Uh, anyway, and this was our uh, co-chairman, Frank. This guy is uh, Frank. pretty much my right-hand guy. If, if there's anything technical that needs to be done, and he's, if he was the one that pretty much got talked Anthony into doing field day, uh, we, we both ended up backing him and uh, I couldn't do it with without either one of these guys as they are just the top in their class. This is what we call the uh, um, the evil Santa. <laughs> well, he's got nice shades. He's actually, uh, this man is actually Jim Grover. He's a uh, um, uh, professor of electronics, or he was he re retired, and he worked for Akron U for 30-some years. 
Is he one of these crazy smart no, people? He, he's the nicest guy you'd ever want to meet. He's, yeah. He acts crazy sometimes, and he loves my grandkids. And this <laughs> is, uh, this, oh, I, I've been, man, what a I, look. I've been picking on this guy ever since they took this picture. I can tell what he's he thinking. Like that thing just reached out and slapped him on the knee. I can tell what he's thinking. He's thinking, well, the short end is up there, and the, so the signal is going to go that way. And so the, if we want it to talk that way, i got to point this short, this short pointy thing in that direction. <laughs> Or vice versa, that one of the a two. Great photo. <laughs> that is just epic. This was actually one of our uh, one of our antennas. Very nice. We did not go with any uh, beams this year, and it worked no. out really well. The uh, That's good. manpower didn't really call for it. We have uh, we have five or six different beams we could have put up. We did uh, everything with either vertical or uh, uh, dual dipoles. Uh, yep, those four, wire up. 40 and, 40 and 80 and uh, uh, lower band dipoles. And what do you do for 80? Do you do it like a 64 well, foot footer and use it as a quarter wave? Or how do, how we, do you we know, actually eight, have 100. 80 is a trouble spot. We actually have 100 and something. It's a, it's a half wave uh, dipole for 80. We got the room, That's you know. That's a sizable dipole. We got the room. There, this... Uh, from one end of the site to the other is probably about a half a mile and we can use oh, any wow. of it if you look over here on the left hand side i don't know if you can see my mouse pointer or not but uh over here on the left is is our generator that uh mm -hmm. that provides the power for all the radios the trailers and the sites and everything and this awesome. is like i said uh, this is uh, mayor john probonic and his wife cindy talking to anthony uh he was, America. he was so nice to uh, to stop in and drop in to see us, and uh, he spent just about an hour there, and for a you know a mayor of a city like that, I, I expected 15, 20 We're minutes. We're going to talk about that here in a second. Why that's important to have an official come. We'll but, talk about that in a minute. But he's a great dude, and it was just really nice to see him. I hadn't seen him since two thousand six, and that's uh, awesome. But uh, it was it was great to see him. All right, that's all my slides. I didn't want to bore everybody with a. I could have had a lot more. Yeah, you don't want to bore everybody like I did. So <laughs> I didn't say that, Jerry, but I knew you were gonna you you were gonna have that many, so I just kind of cut it. I do have you a. You may not have said it, but you were thinking it. Before you are our evil announcer. Before we do that uh, thing on the, uh, uh, on Anthony, um, I wanted to show you a quick video that. Uh, as to how our antennas get put up, this is a. You'll find this very interesting. You may even want to talk your group into doing it. So let me okay. let me run this here. Let me for two or three hours. And what happens is I I have it set. I'm going to take. Because I don't them want fast forward people to... tying up my bandwidth for all that time. I don't want you to really hear what I'm so saying it'll, here. Uh, it'll time them up. Okay. You got a you got a crew out there. They obviously have put these up before because they're working together. Okay, what you're seeing here, let me freeze frame it here. The vertical thing out here is actually a, uh, a what they call a um, falling derrick. It's a it's a derrick pole is what we do. It's got four okay. four ropes on it, and you take an in order to pull this antenna, which is laying on the ground here. Okay. Is, in order to pull that up, that derrick gets put on a this L-shaped thing, and it is actually pulled and guided and, and held steady by the ropes. When you put the force on uh, it, so in order to keep the thing from shifting from side to side, you tension those ropes on the side, and it comes right straight up. I'm going to run this out to about three minutes here. So. It should be all right from about here. <clears throat> this is actually how this thing's go this thing works. Now that is quite a sight. Now see, he's going to walk over here in a minute, and they're getting so ready you've to. You've got the der the derrick pole. Uh, that's basically what holds the entire works up. 
and and you're just you're you're using a group of people to put the guys up we have done this yeah, with three I people do. before as you notice there's one there's one in the front there are guy in the back there he's yep. actually going to pull it in a minute if i didn't get by that i don't think i did I can see people driving, uh, driving around. Uh, there, there was a road in the back there. I'll have to ask you in a minute how many people you had visit. And there it goes. Yep. Boy, that's fascinating. And you, that's as you see, right there, there were three people that pulled that. And we've yep. done that with complete towers before. You actually, you can actually tie that, uh, the one line that go, goes to that derrick pole, you can actually tie that to a winch because it's a steel cable. You can tie that to a winch and it goes right up that way too. Now, I will commend the club, your, your club, on uh, one thing that I'm seeing right now. I'm seeing safety first. I'm seeing people <laughs> in hard hats that have proper uh, protective gear. And uh, it is obvious that this is being done in an orchestrated manner, uh, that they know exactly what their jobs are, and they're carrying those out. So uh, if you uh, look on big, the, big kudos, if you look bef big kudos. The, by the guy in the yellow, the yellow hat there, yes. if you look below him, it's, of course, it's not going to show it now. There are these little orange flags. And what those little orange flags represent? See, see it there in front of him? Yeah, I see them. There are right. several around that around that tower. That represents the fall zone for that uh, for that tower or for that that pole. Even when we're putting that up or taking it down or anything like that, everything is to stay outside of the fall zone. And what that is is the safety zone in case that tower or that that antenna comes down. That's awesome. Well and thought out. When we go to put the, uh, when we go to put a trailer or something in, the trailer will go right by this, uh, right by the guy with the yellow, the yellow helmet. Mm. Actually, we were quite a bit further away than that, but that's how we we've, we've been putting our towers up like this for about five or six years now. And it's a You've very got it down to a science. Buddy. It's a very e efficient thing. This was actually the idea of this was given to us by a uh, an oil rigger he was yeah he was part of our clubs the guy's name was uh, russ russell and uh, russell shaw actually <clears throat> he actually uh had everybody uh, or he had everybody in a meeting he says i don't know why you guys are pushing those antennas up like that i got away let me show you and he <laughs> helped us he helped us design the tower bases and everything and I'm telling you, this is incredible. We were using 14 and 16 people to put these towers up before. You yes. had three this time. That is amazing. That's, a, that's just absolutely incredible. Somebody needs to draw those plans up and share that around. You that, can that, you can find them on, just look up Falling Derek on the Internet. Falling Derek, Okay. And that will uh, lead you to the place to get to get all the stuff. If you need any more, just let me know, and I'll I can give you a couple of good links to it. There's uh, also good. some stuff on Facebook about it. This has that's pretty that's pretty impressive, Pat. Thank I, you. I appreciate you sharing that tonight. That's awesome. Uh, if you if your club, if you're going to actually put, we we've actually installed this time we put up five antennas, and three of them were done with this Derek. Oh, that was one of the questions I were I was going to ask you. How many stations did you run? We five? were we were uh, five alpha, so that's five okay. stations. Two of them or three of them were in one tra one trailer though. We had How the. How did that go? Didn't didn't have a problem at all. They no were RFI? they were on no, they, no issues. They were all on different bands. It was a CW on the the CW would tell each other they were switching around. Right. So that they wouldn't interfere with each other or get on the same band. I just well, can't imagine them, though, being in the same uh, same band and not having a problem, even with the fact that they were switching around. It's the uh, way the antennas are set up. Plus, we used this. Okay. Uh, this year, we tried using this um, uh, stub. Frank designed a couple of stubs for, for that particular trailer. 
And the okay. stubs really worked out well. The stubs act like a um, like a filter. You know, we I, had a notch filtering set, but it malfunctioned. And the notch filtering does okay, but the stubs in, com in combined with that usually works a little bit better. I, I I'll think it worked quite a bit better. Information on the stubs too. That we probably I'll have to get you in touch with Frank on. I'm, I've asked good. Frank to be on the show, but I. If he's got cold feet. I'm gonna to have to warm him up a little bit. <laughs> Tell him that I don't bite. Well, we'll have to. We'll get him in here. That uh, that's the what I had for for that particular thing. Um, well, that's awesome. Your your presentation is outstanding. Thank so, you. So, I we're we're really long on time here, but that's okay. We knew we were gonna go long. I hear the the station owner. So uh, it's all good. Yeah, he won't get but, mad till uh, about eleven or eleven thirty. <laughs> and it's I'll what? I'll be in bed by it's then. It's what eight so now? <laughs> there's no worries. So uh, I guess we've got another really nice video to run. So and boy, that one was great. The one we just saw was fantastic. I'm going to uh, run the so first. We're gonna see that one. This uh, this video is available on uh, three three zero to go. Um, the Facebook what site. What is three three zero to go? It's a Facebook news site. It's run okay. by a guy by the name of Hank, or, or uh, I, his name is Hank, and uh, he's he's got two or three uh, people that work with him. All they they run around to different events. If, if something's happening news-wise, he's there. But uh, awesome. it's all internet news. <clears throat> uh, a fr another friend of mine, uh, Keith, knew him. And and asked him to come out to to visit us. Contacted him. Hey, why don't you come out? And he said, well, why not? I'll be out there. So he come out uh, Saturday afternoon about 4, and he made this vi video I'm going to show you. This video is actually about 23 minutes long, and it really does a good okay. job of everything. But I think the most important part is about 10 minutes long. So let's uh, let's roll to that. Well, you just roll it and then break it away whenever you want to, or the okay. thing out. It doesn't matter to me, so it's up to you. All right, we'll this be... is The World According to Elmer on the Crooked River Radio. We'll be back. Folks, we got a red dot. Welcome back to Akron's hottest and fastest growing show, 330 Gone. I'm your host, Hank. Coming to you live from Stowe, Ohio. We're at Silver Springs Park Campground right now. And we've been invited to check out Amateur Ham Radio Field Day 2022. So what is Field Day? Well, first of all, let me tell you, let me show you who invited us. It's the Cuyahoga Falls Amateur Radio Club. All right. So let's go ahead and get that right there. And I'm going to flip it so that you can have their QR code. So when you pause this video later, all you got to do is scan that QR code and you can find out more information about them. All right. So there are there are so many things that take place during field day, okay? And there are so many reasons that they do field day. And here are all the reasons. And, and we're gonna go over these in just a bit. And then here are all the activities that are actually taking place right here in Stowe that you all can come participate in over the next 24 hours or so, all right? But right now what I'm gonna do before we go over this, to go over this, I'd like to bring down Anthony. Anthony here is part of the team that's in charge and responsible for this event. So thank you so much for being a being a part of the show. You're very welcome. All right, so talk loud. All right. Yes, I'm Anthony Lustry. My personal call is K8ZT, but we're using the club's call sign for this W8VPV. Now some of the stations are using phonetics so that stations can pick those letters out because V's and P's are hard to distinguish between. So when we go to some of the stations and you hear the recordings, they're going to be saying Whiskey 8, Victor, Papa, Victor. Just to make it a little bit easier to pick out the, the different letters. All right, so let's go over what, so so I, we've got this whole list of yes. things here. What is Field Day? Field Day is a, is a demonstration of amateur radio emergency communications. It takes place at about two to three hundred, two to three thousand stations around the U.S., Canada, and North America. And each of the stations operates either from home or most of the stations operate from emergency power field setups like we're doing at this local park. Uh, some of the stations operate mobile, so there's a variety of different ways stations can operate. We exchange some information just as practice that we would do similar to an emergency. So if there was a tornado in there, we might be doing health and welfare information, uh, site, uh, ground uh, view of what's going on in the area. But for this purpose, because it's just a practice, we send the number of stations we're operating, so we're five stations. 
the letter A to distinguish that we're operating on emergency power in the field and Ohio, our location. All right, so so Anthony, give us an idea. So we, we talked about this uh, before we went live. Like a perfect example of an emergency situation would have been what happened down in the Shreve, Mansfield, and Worcester area with all the winds last week. Yes. Right? In other words, there's no power and there's no communication. So you guys yes. basically set your thing up and away you go. Yes, we could come in and we could tr exchange information. We have a number of different ways. We're doing voice, Morse code, digital. We also have another form of digital, which we're going to be demonstrating later tonight, where we can actually do something very similar to email without using the Internet. All right, so tell me, um, so I see, I'm looking at the what is field day card, okay? And it says amateur radio stations around the U.S., over 5,000 stations. They're exchanging numbers. Um, now you can get tours and all that sort of thing. But it says at the bottom, classes. Could you explain to us what the yeah, classes are? The classes are? just simply say what type of station it is. So we're class A, which means we're a field setup with more than three members using emergency power. Class B would be one or two members, typically out on a camping trip with emergency power. Class C means it's a mobile, like a car, a truck, a boat, anything like that that can operate while in motion. Class D means that there's someone at home who's using commercial power. So even though they're not doing anything differently, they can be the resource that we can contact to pass that information. Then 1E is a home station using all their normal setup except for the using emergency power. Maybe they have a generator or a battery they're operating from. And the final group is special stations called F. Those F stations are emergency communication centers like the Red Cross, FEMA, et cetera. Those are the big boys. Okay. Yes. All right, and then you've got all these activities that are taking yes, place here. I do. And one of the things we do in amateur radio is we, we're very involved in education. Our group is a 503C group and involved in education. We work with uh, school children, but we also do classes for anyone that's interested. So we do licensing classes. And we have some activities here on this sheet that people can shoot with their QR codes. And do, for example, make a little Morris code key out of a battery, a clothespin, and some thumbtacks, which is a fun little project to do. Sure. Also have information here on how to use your your phone as a remote receiver using uh, online software-defined radios around the world. So you can actually tune them very similar to if you had a ham radio at your house, but without an antenna or a radio, you can use these devices across the Internet to tune stations around the world in. Once again, uh, folks, as you rewatch this video, all you have to do is pause, and you can actually read the... Um, the different websites or you can scan those QR codes um, for, for, for anything you might be interested in. And if they'd like the whole sheet, they can simply go to tiny.cc slash H-R-Y-C. That's tiny.cc slash H-R-Y-C. Got it. All right. All right. So, so let's talk about the actual stations now. So, yes. so what's going on behind us right here? Right now, uh, Evan is doing Morse code. And so right now he's sending CQ, which means he's calling for anyone that's out there. They'll respond to him. Then he'll send our call, W8VPV. Okay. Then he'll wait to see if anyone responds to him. And we've already had some people respond. You had said yes. that we've got those listed. Yeah, we've already worked about three or 400 stations on it combined. Okay, and what, what are some of these locations that are listed right here in this list? Oh, uh, Los Angeles. He's been working a lot of California stations. Uh, now he's using a, a, a hand key, so when he squeezes on one side, it sends a dash. When he squeezes on the other side, it sends a dot. And all the Morse code characters are made up of dashes and dots. For example, the letter A would be one dash. I'm sorry, one dot and then one dash. It would be did all. Okay. And then what else is going on in this trailer? So he's also logging every station he works. So he's using a computer for logging. We're not connected to the Internet, but the two uh, stations are connected via Wi-Fi, and we're, that way they exchange the information. So when one station works... A station, another station will know and they won't work now, again. Now, do you set it up so that it's a repetitive um, message? Yes. As a matter of fact, we have um, they can strike certain keys on the keyboard and it'll send our exchange automatically. Which okay. It's really nice at three in the morning when you're getting a little tired of sending with your hand. Sure, sure. All right. So let's talk talk yeah. about their, our antenna, our antennas here. So this is a vertical antenna right here, and this antenna does multiple amateur radio bands very simple antenna we use different types then we have these horizontal wires which you can see if you look at the flag and look out from there I see them we have a lot of rope that extends out and then there's a copper wire there okay and that what does then that do it connects the other antennas yeah, then the, the, that copper that copper wire has a feed line we call it coax cable okay very similar to what comes in your house if you have a, uh, uh, a cable TV or it comes down from your antenna on the roof and that runs to each of the stations so we connect all the antennas to the radios we also have a generator out in the field. If you look a little bit to the right of that, you'll okay. see that white generator out there. 
That is a diesel generator that's generating power for all the stations. And, and we have a power cord coming over here that runs into the van and provides the communication. And you said there's five stations total? Yes. And you can see there, these trailers over here are set up. We actually have a total of seven stations. We have five primary stations and we have a new station called Get On The Air. It's for new people who have never done this before so we can train them how to operate the other station. And then we have one other station that's called it's a VHF station, it's a high frequency station, so the communications are typically much more local. So With the HF stations, we have communications around the world, around the U.S. very easily. Once again, folks, uh, you're allowed to come down and check this out. It is uh, free to the general public, and they would love to be able to educate you on this. Again, we are at Silver Springs uh, Park Campground in Stowe, Ohio right now. All right, so talk, talk to me about this get on the air thing. Is yes. this the one where you're allowed to talk on the air? Well, yeah, if, if they want to come in, they want to be a guest, we'll have, we have, you have to be licensed to be able to do it, but we'll have a control operator who will actually operate the radio, but they can put their, send their voice out. Okay. So if they want to come out and give it a try, they can do that. Okay. Uh, walk our, we're going to walk right over here. All right. I'm going to pick the screen up so you can see here. Okay. So I guess we're going to have to go around. No, that's fine. We'll go around the other side here. Watch your own trip on the wires here. I won't. This is the trailer that uh, did Jim Barry. a thousand okay. or eleven hundred contacts. Jim is sitting right there. Okay. He's pounding them out. There, talking to somebody somewhere yes. across the country. Yeah, we'll hear what the call is in a moment here. The Alpha Alpha station, go. So here at the station, he didn't get the full call sign, so he's asking him to repeat it. Alpha Alpha Zero Radio Whiskey Five Alpha Ohio. So the Alpha Alpha Zero station is somewhere in the Midwest. Okay. Whiskey 8 Victor Papa Victor. He Whiskey records in his log. Papa Victor. In, in, for example, Jim has worked almost 200 contacts in the first two hours. Okay. And he's doing quite a few. Okay. CQ Field Day, CQ Field Day. Whiskey 8 Victor Papa Victor. Whiskey 8 now, Victor guys, Papa Victor. Do you guys take rotations as you yes, do this? Yes, we do. So we, take, we do a couple of our shifts. Libby's, Libby, our young lady Libby's going to take over for Jim in a few minutes. Okay. And, uh, He'll take a little bit of a break. Okay. But we'll go 24 hours, so we'll have people out here all night operating. Now, for the general public, we suggest you come out during daylight hours. It's not really safe to walk around the field day site when it's dark. So, And we won't have our visitors center set up. So the best okay. time to come is tomorrow between 10 and 2. Okay. So as Bankers hours, 10 and 2. Come between 10 and 2. <laughs> Well, that doesn't I, mean uh, we are. We, I, I think that was a good point that Anthony made. If you're going to come visit, come visit when the day, uh, when it's daytime as opposed to night, because just too much out there on the ground to be out there in the middle of the night walking around. That comes back to that same thing we were talking about early, earlier, Pat, about uh, safety first. You've got to, uh, you got to have your your site safe. In fact. One of the things that you receive extra points for is having a safety officer and having those safety plans that you were talking about earlier, Pat, uh, in place. We've got one more short video to show you guys tonight before we wrap this up. It's going to talk about that safety officer and the other things that clubs uh, do during the course of field day to get extra points from the ARRL. And so this is a very worthwhile a video from our friend Michael, uh, KB9VBR, and uh, so he's going to tell us about those points. Now, now, Pat, while we watch this, do a mental calculation and see how many extra points you've got coming. <laughs> All right, you're listening to the uh, World According to Elmer on Crooked River Radio. We'll be back on the other side to wrap it up. Are you leaving points on the table? We're going to look at bonus opportunities for ARRL Field Day. Keep watching for more. Hi, I'm Michael, KB9VBR, your host for Ham Radio q and I'm on a mission to inspire and educate the amateur radio community, so if this is your first time here, please consider subscribing to this channel. Well, Field Day is the annual emergency preparedness operating event that's sponsored by the ARRL. Held on the fourth full weekend of June, Field Day is part contest and part social gathering. Some clubs or groups go whole hog in making contacts and scoring points, while others take a more casual approach and use that time to reconnect with fellow hams. Our local club falls somewhere in the middle of that. Uh, we've got a few people that are really uh, gung-ho on scoring the points and others 
that are just there for the fellowship and the camaraderie. Well, that's that's great, and and uh, that's what I love about Field Day. It's it can it can accomplish all of that stuff. So, do you want to make Field Day a more rewarding activity and boost your club score at the same time? Well, then go for the bonus points. Uh, the AWRL provides up to 3,950 additional bonus points that you can receive, and some of these and these can really make a big difference to your final score. In fact, our local club, some years we score more on the bonus than we do on actual contacts. So, what bonuses are available? Well, let's break them down. The first few bonus bonus points are going to be pretty self-explanatory, and, and just about all clubs are going to are going to um, receive those. So. First up in, uh, in bonuses for AWRL Field Day is 100% emergency power. You, know, you get 100 points for each transmitter that's uh, up for up to 20 transmitters or 2,000 points that are used that are on a source that's completely independent from commercial electrical mains. That would involve using batteries, generators to provide power. Next is media publicity. Be sure to send a news release to your local newspaper, radio, or television stations. Doing so will net you another 100 points. If you want reporters to actually visit your field day site, then give them a follow-up call the Friday before the event and talk to either the assignment editor or the news director of the media outlet so that they are reminded about the event and they know where it is. Public location. This point gets you also, this bonus also gets you 100 points if you place your station in a local park or other facility that's open to the public, schools and shopping centers, or other great uh, locations. Can private property be considered a public location? It sure can, as long as the public is invited. In the past, we've used scout camps and also a, a privately owned field to uh, run our field day operation. So as long as the public's invited to attend, you're, you're good to go. In fact, if you're inviting the public, you can get you. You also need a public information table. Doing that will net you another hundred bonus points, and it can be as simple as putting out a table with a small display, uh, maybe a few pamphlets, brochures, and of course a sign-up sheet so you can track who who stops by and maybe follow up with them later. A message to the uh, section manager: Send a radiogram to your ARRL section manager and, and get another hundred bonus points. This message needs to be transmitted during field day, and you have to use uh, NTS-style format. So check your local HF net schedule to find out when those nets will be operating so you can send that message during the event. As you're sending the message to your section manager, don't forget that you can also get 10 additional bonus points, up to 100, for each piece of NTS, National Traffic System, traffic that you originate from your field day site. Uh, like I said, up to 100 points. Uh, the messages must leave uh, the site over the radio waves, so, but you can use any method means, HF or VHF or whatnot. We typically use WinLink to send these messages out over the, over the radio waves. Satellite QSO, that's another 100 bonus points. All of those birds in the air are worth 100 points if you can, if you can make a two-way contact on one. Satellite contacts can be challenging, so you may want to designate one or two people whose task is specifically to do those contacts. Alternate power, that's another opportunity. In addition to using your generator for providing the emergency power during the event, uh, you can receive up to 100 bonus points if you make five contacts using an alternate power method. Uh, that can be solar, wind, uh, methane, water, anything um, besides using a uh, gasoline-powered generator to provide uh, power. Uh, you can even use the solar or whatnot to charge the batteries and then the batteries at the event for your, for your alternate power QSOs. So uh, think about that in planning your alternate power needs. Uh, the W1AW Bulletin. Net 100 points if you copy a W1AW bulletin. That's transmitted several times over the field day weekend. This bulletin is transmitted via code, phone, and data modes, and it must be uh, accurately copied. I usually try to copy uh, this bulletin multiple times during the weekends on uh, multiple methods so that I can kind of reconstruct the message into one, uh, one complete piece. Uh, don't forget those. Um, Check the AWRL schedule for when those bulletins are transmitted, and check different bands because propagation may be different for where you're located. 
educational activity bonus. If you're participating with a club, you should really go uh, provide some sort of educational activity. A formal activity um, that is amateur radio uh, related will net you 100 bonus points. Need some ideas? Well, uh, maybe you should check out my blog at www.jpol-antenna.com uh, for some ideas that make great uh, a field day bon uh, educational opportunities. A site visitation by a local elected government official. There elected go, officials Pat. love to get out and meet their constituents, and their presence gets you 100 bonus points. So send an invitation to your community's mayor, alderpersons, board members, or supervisors. Be sure to tell them the benefits of amateur radio to your community and how you can provide a valuable service at no extra taxpayer expense. They'd love to hear that. So when you're invited, inviting an elected official, don't forget to extend an invitation out to your local emergency management, a Red Cross director, the Salvation Army, or other served agency that your group is involved with. Doing that will get you 100 extra points. Go to bonus. Get on the air stations are a great way for new hams or visitors to have a non-threatening, casual way to experience the fun of field day and amateur radio. A go to operator can amass up to 100 bonus points, and up to five operators can receive a total of 500 bonus points for your club during the field day weekend. Go to stations have some very specific requirements, so be sure to read the rules on their operation. In addition to GOTA operation, you can get up to 20 bonus points. You can get 20 bonus points up to 100 for each youth, 17 and under, that gets on the air during field day weekend. So be sure to get those kids radioactive and score some extra points. Publicizing your site via social media can get you another 100 points. So if you're active on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or any of the other social channels, uh, be sure you, you do some posts during field day weekend and tag the ARRL at the same time. One of the most important bonuses that you can receive is designating a safety off officer for field day weekend. This person um, must complete a safety checklist in the rules packet and assure that your event operation is a safe one. I have a video on field day safety, so I'll be sure to check that out. And last but not least, you can receive a 50 point bonus for online submission of your field day results. So after everything is said and done, be sure to send your results electronically to the ARRL and claim that bonus and claim all those bonus points that you are entitled to. By my count, that's 3,950 points. That's quite a haul and can certainly be a big effect on your final score. But um, will you be able to get every point available uh, field day weekend? Probably not, but there's no reason that you, can, you cannot score at least 1,050 points in bonuses this weekend. So does your club go after field point uh, bonuses? Uh, how many do you usually score on a weekend? Please feel free to leave some comments below. I'd love to hear how many your group racks up. For ham more ham radio articles, please check my blog at www.jpole-antenna.com and also give me a big thumbs up. That's a cue to other people um, to help them find these videos. And, also, and always don't forget to hit that subscribe button uh, so you'll be notified when future videos are released. Well, I'm Michael, KB9VBR. Have a great day. Have fun at Field Day in 73. Thank you, Michael. We did have fun at Field Day. Thank you very much. Well, how do you think you did, Pat? Did all, were all those... There was, only one, there was only one thing he talked about that I didn't, we didn't do, and that was What's because that? we couldn't find anybody. Was, uh, it was a government agency thing. Everything now, else we invited, did. Now, here was my question on that. Was it, is it the invitation itself? Because I invited a government official. It, you uh, have, is it they have to come? They have to come. They have to come on site. Uh, then we're going to miss that one, too. Yeah, that's about the only one that we would have missed out on. We did the uh, communications with the uh, the state or the AWR representat representation, the uh, uh, we even did the um, the solar thing. <clears throat> we made the uh, the solar contacts and all that. Um, there were there were some changes that they made as far as the uh, the social media side of this. It used to be if you just posted a, a thing about field day on your on your social media site, you could count that as a points. Now they actually okay. want now they actually want you to uh, 
uh, be participating from field day on the on the uh, on the uh, whatever site, the social media site. We, which we did. We put pictures up all yeah, through field day. That's what we did too. That was the idea of three 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 zero to go and all that. Well, now that on now that on a couple of the the platforms like Facebook, uh, you know, in spite of my feelings about that platform. One of the good things they have, anybody that, that can pick up their cell phone can just go on to, to uh, Facebook and they've got a camera right here and they can broadcast to the world. Well, what a great way to bring people down to field day, uh, getting, on that, uh, getting on that site and just telling the world where you're at and what you're doing. Precisely. So, yeah, you know, this is all about uh, trying to make sure that other people know we're there and what we do. And there are future ham radio operators, I'm certain, that attended our field days this year. I'd bet money on it. So uh, have we talked field day out yet? Are we, are we through with field day now for a, a while? Uh, for a week or two anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it was like the last three shows we did field day. So it'll be nice to move on to something else next week. But gosh, has this been fun. This has really been a good time this year so far. It's been a great radio year as we continue to recover from the pandemic. So it's I'm excited get about what's to come yet this year and as we move forward. So many good things happening right now in ham radio, and it's great to be part of them. Folks, thank you for being here this evening. This is The World According to Elmer on the Crooked River Radio Network. That is our Elmer sitting right over there in that chair, Mr. Pat Morrow, N8OQP. I am Jerry. And I'm KG8RRY. We will be back next Tuesday evening right here on the Crooked River at uh, 7 o'clock, same time. So come back next week and see us again. I hope wherever you are that, that you had a fantastic field day and uh, that you can share this hobby uh, with somebody else this week. Until next week, we will see you. 73, and thank you for being with us tonight. 73, y'all. Catch you next week. We hope you enjoyed this presentation of the Crooked River Radio Network. See you again soon.